We're going to buy their fruits. I am your host, Jeremy Stone. I'm with my co-host, John. This is uh, episode three of the new segment, Testimony Central. And tonight we have on Jeremy Anderson. How you doing, Jeremy? I am doing good. I'm happy to be on with you guys as always. Um, it's been a, a rough week as, you know, I know you guys know my wife's been sick and before that, my dog was really sick, but the Lord somehow performed a miracle and saved him without surgery. But my wife still wow. has the stomach virus. So, other than uh, she didn't have, like, they did the blood work and they did a CAT scan, and there was nothing on there except for elevated uh, blood count that was consistent with an infection, viral infection. So you know, that's the only thing they could know for sure. It was, or the thing that, that it looked like the most. Right. So they gave well, her fluids and you know, medicine for the nausea. And I think the thing that helped the most was um, everyone praying for her. Yeah, she, 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 she doing a little better? Uh, um, but no. um, <laughs> she's, she's a little water. She'll be all right. <laughs> she's asleep right now, so she's been sleeping most of the day. I will say this: it could be exhaustion because um, my son had friends over. My dog got sick, and so my wife was the one that had to take him to the vet, and I had to stay here with the boys. And you know, she was there for way over 24 hours. Um, wow. So, you know, she didn't sleep during that time. So she, she could have been, it could be exhaustion that caused her immune system to get low. But you know, she's sleeping right now. So. Well, before we begin, before we get into your testimony of how you came to Christ, do you want to, um, do you want to lead us in prayer? Sure. Sure. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you now. Thank you so very much for this evening. Thank you for allowing me to be on with my brothers tonight. And I thank you that you have promised us so many things in your word, if you will, but follow you. Give us clear instructions on how to live, how to follow Christ. And if we do those things, it is not a promise that our life won't be hard or that we won't go through trials and tribulations. In fact, it's the opposite. It's a promise that we will. But it's also a promise that as we go through those things, we won't go through them alone. You're with us. You give us the strength to go through them. And no matter how much they hurt while we're going through how much it seems like it's an impossible situation or how despairing it is get to the other side of it. Hindsight allows us to see that the only way we got through it at all was just the strength. And it's like a purifying fire. And the things that you allow us to go through Literally strengthen us the same way that iron is strengthened in fire. And I thank you for that strengthening fire of trials and tribulations. It's not an easy thing to thank you for the tribulations. It's not an easy thing to praise you through the storm. But if we are able to do it, then not only does it strengthen our relationship with but it strengthens our faith and enables us to get through the next trial and tribulation much easier. And it, more importantly than anything else, enables us to help others going through similar things that we would not be able to help otherwise. And that is one thing that you've shown me throughout my walk 
with Christ more than anything else is that one of the reasons that you allow us to go through the hardships, the struggles, and the tribulations is in order to reach lost people that we would not be able to otherwise reach. We would not listen to someone we couldn't relate to. Father, I thank you for allowing me to come on here tonight with my brothers to share my testimony. Your word tells us that the way that we overcome the dragon is through the blood of the Lamb. Christ and the word of our testimony. Father, tonight I am going to share the word of my testimony. We are going together to overcome the dragon. I thank you so much for my brother. It is in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that I pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you, man. Thank you for that. Yes. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's one of those times that we've all been going through it the last couple of years, for sure. We've all been through a lot of trials and tribulations, and uh, it, it never gets easier, it seems. But at the end of the day, when that cloud rolls out and the sun starts to shine, do you see how much big, like bigger you are, how much stronger you are in Christ, how much closer you are to him? And whatever you went through, like you said, is another way to relate to somebody who's been through the same thing. Because as Christ says, you know, we're not alone in our sufferings at all. Our, we have plenty of brothers and sisters out there that are suffering with us in the same type of way, in one way or another, you know, and... And I think it's important to spread that word to those who don't know Christ, because unlike unlike us, you know, us Christians, they don't have hope. They don't have hope. They're just uh, they're just kind of hoping to wake up another day and being able to make it. And we're sitting here like trying to give it all to God. You know, mm-hmm. we have we know where our hope lies. Amen. So it's beautiful. All right. Well, let's start off with um. If you don't mind, let's start off from the very beginning, man. Like, what was your childhood like? Um, and then let's get into what planted that seed and then when that seed eventually blossomed. Absolutely. Um, my childhood actually started off great. Um, my mom and dad, they were um, high school sweethearts. They had been together since they were 13. And um, they got married. Young at like the age of 20, and um, not long after my mom got pregnant with me, my dad was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, he had been called into the ministry uh, before she got pregnant, yeah, a long time before. Um, he actually knew that he was supposed to be a minister since he was like 12. Um, and he surrendered to that call um, not long before they got married. He he was going to college. My mom was going to college. Um, and he ended up dropping out because of wanting to, or not wanting, but knowing that he was supposed to be in the ministry and he was going to college for something. And um, not long after that, before he was a, he enrolled in seminary, but before he was able to even get started with it, um, first my mom got pregnant with me, and then like a month later, he was diagnosed with leukemia. And because of the chemo, um, if she would not have gotten pregnant with me when she did, then it would have been impossible. Um, this was the eighties, and you know, cancer treatment. Then was nothing like it is now. The mortality rate was very low or very high. I don't know. Um, the death rate was a, a lot higher, and you had a lot better chance of dying. And anyway, um, you know, he, he started chemo, um, but my mom had me in '84. Um, they had been, been married for a year or two whenever um, she had me, and not long after he was diagnosed, he got a job at the railroad, which, in hindsight, you can see that all of this was God. Um, because he had left college, and you know, back then, you didn't make near as much as you do now at certain jobs. My mom had gone to school to be a phlebotomist, and you know, so she was basically uh, a little higher than a lab tech. She she drew blood, worked at 
hospital in his doctor's office. But because of his sickness, he wasn't able to go to seminary and do what a lot of people, most people do. They go into the ministry and to just become an evangelist. And his leukemia actually opened the door for him to be an evangelist. People allowed him to come in and preach that maybe wouldn't have otherwise. And um, preached for like four years, um, almost four years, because he had, from the time he was diagnosed to the time he passed away, wasn't quite, quite four years. And um, I was a little over three years old when he died, and my mom was, uh, I see John's message. Yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, no, you're, you're fine. fine. The moment you started talking, um, we've had problems with Zoom all night. Um, yeah, I don't want to say it's spiritual warfare. You know, I, hey, it, it, it seems like it. Uh, uh, but um, all of a sudden, my my um, microphone defaulted to my webcam, and then Zoom was just like loading, like it was glitching really badly. Um, and so I made Jeremy Stone the host in case it glitches out completely and I can't do anything. He can end the recording and he can keep recording, even though I won't be here. Because if I leave the meeting, I should be able to do it now as not the host, but I don't want to screw anything up. Um, because as, as, oh, as both Jeremy's can attest, we had problems even logging into the Zoom just straight from the link. It was crazy. Yeah, so like, we had to start several meetings before we were able to get started. But I know yeah, just uh, clear, we're recording on my end still, so we're, we're good. So yeah, mine too. I know last time, um, I don't know what it had me as, as far as uh, whether Zoom had me as a host or a guest, but I know that I was the last one to leave, and I was the one who actually ended the recording um, after everyone else had left. But um, I don't Zoom unless I'm on here with y'all, so I don't really know. As much. On the video part, anyway, I'll edit all of this out. Um, and well, the me to send you the audio from the video that I edited. I can't. It doesn't do it however you want. But um, in any case, the my dad preached as an evangelist until literally a few days before he died. I, um, they were having to help him up to the pulpit to preach. He couldn't walk up there on his own. Uh, we had an episode, I was on here with you guys a while back, and it was supposed to be an end times episode, it ended up being like a spiritual experience episode, and I didn't, I didn't tell about this because I told about the first evil, like demonic experience I had, but the first sp spiritual experience I ever encountered, encountered was a week before my dad died. Um, he was at home. Hospice was there. He had a, you know, a nurse that was there all day and she stayed at the house, slept at the house and everything. And they thought he was going to die that day. But the only reason I believe in out of body experiences is because the only the one person in this world that I know would not lie was my birth father. And like a week he died had an out of body experience and he would have died that day most likely if the, the nurse wouldn't have finally given him something to bring his blood pressure back to normal. Um, he was literally begging them not to because he was not in any pain and he was always in agony even when they were giving him more. But when he was having this experience, he was able to see himself laying on the couch with the all the machines and the IV and everything. You can see his his body. You can see everybody else. And my mom, my grandma, everybody thought he was just out of his head because he was so close to death. But he was able to prove to them that what was happening to him was real and he was out of his body. Um, there were people coming to the house constantly. He was about to die. And 
And so, you know, there were family and friends coming all the time and lived uh, not far from where I live now. Uh, and we lived down at the end of a very long dirt road. And he was able to tell them not only everybody was coming down the driveway to come to the house as they were coming before they got there. In the very back of the house where there are no windows or any way for him to see, but he also was able to tell them what they were wearing when they got out of the car, what they were listening to on the radio in their cars, things that could not have known unless he was able to go where they were and see. And, you know, growing up Southern Baptist, my dad, before this had happened, he didn't believe in experiences like this. My mom didn't believe in experiences like this. They were the definition of cessationists. But a lot of that changed because of this. But anyways, um, that the reason I tell that story is because it is something that I have always remembered throughout my life, and it has helped to keep me grounded in my belief in Christ, no matter how far away from my faith I would get, I could not escape the fact of what had happened when I was a child that was absolutely real, and then also the the demonic experience that I talked about in the other episode. Those two things only happened maybe five years apart. So it let me know from a very early age that both the good side of the spiritual realm was real and the evil side. And that the good side, God, had way more power than the enemy and the demonic. But you, know, you get older and things in life happen and um, you, know, you grow away fall farther away from the Lord. My, mom, my dad died like a week after that experience. And my mom eventually married my stepdad about it, about a year and a half later. And um, he had, uh, or, or they had children. I, I, I had other brothers and sisters that were half brothers and one sister. Um, I had three brothers and one sister. Now I have two brothers and one sister. So 2020, uh, one of my brothers got hit by a car and was killed. But my stepdad, anything that was good that my, my birth father did instilled in me when I was really young, my stepdad beat out of me. And he was extremely abusive to both me and my mom, verbally, physically. The only kind of abuse he wasn't was sexual. Um, I, I don't hold anything against him. I love him. He's Christian now. And, you know, we've got as much of a relationship as we can have. Um, my mom and him ended up divorcing when I was a teenager. And that left her as a single mom with all of these kids to raise, with him only seeing us on the weekends and eventually only seeing uh, my brothers and sister because I wasn't his. And by the time I was a teenager, didn't want anything to do with him. And you know, as a single mom, we ended up having to move out of the house that I grew up in and from birth until I was a teenager into a pretty bad neighborhood or in town instead of, or in the city instead of in the country. And from junior high on, I got involved with as much of the wrong crowd as I could. Um, one thing that my stepdad did that I was thankful for as a teenager and as an early young adult was he made me what I thought was tough, strong. Um, I wasn't scared of anyone. Um, I was scared of a lot of things, but I wasn't scared of heroin. 
by the time I was in the ninth grade, if someone wasn't in the crew that I was running with, then they were either rich kids or an enemy. Um, by the time I was in ninth grade, I was extremely involved in gangs. Um, I uh, was selling drugs. I met my wife when I was 13, but we didn't start dating until I was 15. She probably kept me from getting killed, killing someone, or going to prison for life at, at a very early age because there were a lot of things that I would have done, would have taken part in that she talked me out of. Um, but I was still running with gangs constantly. And so at 15, I got arrested for the first time. Um, even though I was a juvenile, uh, I had run away from home with other gang members living in Myrtle Beach. Broke in a house. We weren't like trying to rob people. We were living in this vacation home from somebody's that they weren't living in. I mean, they weren't there because it was a vacation home and it was a win. But somebody saw us, apparently, a neighbor or somebody, and called the police after we had been there for a few weeks. And cops came in. And so my very first arrest was for first degree burglary. Um, and even though I was a uh, juvenile, I was in a gang. So that was strike against me with any judge I was to go in front of. Um, and so even though it was my very first charge, I was sent to prison, juvenile prison, where I experienced a lot of bad things. I've been to jail many times as an adult. Thank the Lord I've never been to prison as an adult, but I know a lot of people who have been to prison as an adult also went to prison as a juvenile some the same time period i did and others the same place i was in and every last one of them will attest to you that the juvenile prison is extremely worse than the adult prison um, the adult prison has a lot more privileges and the juvenile prison at least in the state i live in a lot more dangerous. Uh, first of all, you know, you have the, it's full of hormone flaring juvenile guys, most of which are hard criminals, though they're teenagers. Some of them are in there for murder, some of them for rape. I mean, juvenile prison is very bad. And I never, ever wanted to go back when I finally got out. And I was in there for, I want to say, six months um, before my sentence was, like, I, I was let out and sent to a, um, a different facility. It was actually a rehab type facility. Um, and I stayed there for 30 days, but it was like a resort compared to the prison. But you would think that I would have learned my lesson never wanting to go back. But I actually came out of the juvenile prison a lot more hardened than I was when I went in. And I'll say this, um, there needs to be at least prison reform where kids are concerned. But there needs to be reform in pretty much every area of life because the answer is Jesus, not all of these other things. I mean, the powers that should be have made the world to where people are, no matter what walk of life they come from, they are influenced by evil everywhere they turn. It doesn't matter how much money they have. You know, I know more rich kids that have been to prison than I do people on the street like that. 
grew up in gangs and never had money growing up. And the majority of that is because, you know, they were spoiled and at the same time, they had the same influences from society that everyone else has. And society is designed, TV and everything else, Hollywood, music, all of it is designed to take away the belief in God. Take God out of the equation. Take his word out of the equation. Then what you are left with is people who are being raised up the opposite of the way they should go, no matter how much they have in this life, how many opportunities they have. If they don't have Christ in their life, they're not in church, they don't have someone who cares enough about them to tell them the truth and share Christ with them, then they're pretty much doomed. And I don't think that, as far as I'm concerned, that the reason that I ended up where I was at was because, you know, we were poor. That may have had some part to play in it, but I've, I've just seen too many people that are millionaires that, are, that went to prison as kids and are in prison to this day, some of them for life for murder. Um, it's just, that, I mean, you guys know, it's society we live in, the world, can the can whole you, world. Can I ask you a question real quick, Jimmy? Um, I pretty much probably will ask every single person um, when we're discussing testimonies. Um, even though you grew up knowing of the gospel, okay, um, do you still... Like, the way I believe it is, is, like, uh, biblically, none of us seek after the gospel in and of ourselves, right? right. Like, we don't, like, search it out the way it detests it, because we have the incapability of doing so fully, um, of, of kind of, way, you know, of, of the truth of God and the truth of the gospel in and of itself. It's a revealed mystery to us by the Holy Spirit. Right. So, you know, what was there a time, and I know you're getting to it, where, like, like I guess, I guess I... I guess what I want to say is, is there there is a there is various points within your life and various points within anybody's testimony where God is lining up for them to become born again. Now, obviously, I'm the not a Calvinist, whole time. but it's the still whole there. Time. Um, I was, and so, you know, let me briefly finish with. Um, so it's something that you didn't discover on your own. It's something that even though you had the pre the truth had been preached to you. It is something that, you know, you stumbled into. It was something that was, you know, it wasn't like you were seeking it. It was something where the gospel and the truth and God found you. You were the one sheep that Jesus had left the 99 to find. Because God ultimately knew that you were going to become born again. Absolutely. And so your whole life led up to that moment. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, and I, I've seen the same thing with many other people. Um, you know, even though I chose to be with the the type of people I was with most of the week, and you know, I, I ran away from home multiple times. My mother was a Christian. She kept us in church um, as much as she could until we were old enough to where she could physically make us do anything. You know, she was a single mother raising boys, um, and. I was the most rebellious of them all. And though um, you were in church, it didn't click. It didn't uh, click. Uh, well, it, it did. It, part, it, part, parts of it did. At 14, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was calling me into the ministry. But I, actually, I told Jeremy this the other day in a message. Um, until I was born again, I had an ability. Um, and it really didn't start. Until, I mean, it started at a young age, but it didn't start until I was molested at about the age of six. Um, I had the ability to compartmentalize anything. Um, I had the, the ability to block things out like they didn't exist, like they hadn't happened. And 
I didn't realize that they were building inside of me, you know, something that was eventually going to explode. Um, I, I know now that probably more than likely the reason I was able to compartmentalize is the same reason that, that people are, you know, that their personalities are shattered and it's like a, a protection mechanism that, that God allows us to have. But I was also a demon possessed. I know this. You know, I was infatuated with death. I listened. I didn't just listen to hardcore uh, music and I didn't just listen to rap music. It had to be talking about murder. It had to be the artist gangster rap music in existence. Um, that was the only thing I liked. Uh, that and eventually when I was older, trap music about selling drugs and I can remember the only reason I joined the gang is because I didn't live in New York and couldn't I wasn't Italian and couldn't join the mafia you know, that is what I wanted I wanted to be a criminal I mean that's what it boiled down to I, I wanted to be what you see on TV and I knew it was real life but I aspired to be the person that everybody either looked up to or feared. And because of that, it almost got me killed numerous times because there were many, many people who felt the same way I did. And that's just the way that lifestyle is, you know. Um, everybody wants to be on top. Everybody thinks that they are more dangerous than the other person. And the key thing is everybody thinks that if they have a gun, they are invincible. Doesn't matter how many of their friends they've seen get blown away with the gun. They had a gun at the same time and were shooting right back. Doesn't matter. If they have a gun, they think at that time they're invincible. And I think a lot of it has to do with when we're young, we don't think about our mortality. Don't think about how quickly life can yeah. Yeah. and and you take that and you add the culture of the nineties and you had a white person and I'm not trying to make this about race in any way, but as a white person in a predominantly black neighborhood, I felt I had something to prove to be accepted. It was like I had to be the crazy white boy. Or they weren't going to accept me. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't accept white people as it was. It wasn't 2024. It was, you know, 1998, 1999. And I'm not saying that there weren't any friendships between black people and white people. But in the gang culture, especially a predominantly all-black gang like the one I was in. I mean, it's called the Black Gangster Disciples. Um, <laughs> it just, there are very few white people that are even allowed to hang out with that crowd, much less do the things necessary that I can't even talk about without <laughs> this having to be a video that goes on a different platform, um, you know, there are things that has to be done in order to join pretty much every gang in existence, regardless of the race or gang or the city that it's in or the sect of the gang. There are things that has to be done that most people know what they are, but can't go into detail about them. And even before I joined the gang, I felt like I had something. Um, and that goes back to my stepdad. Like, he told me I was weak. Uh, you know, growing up from the time I was a child to a teenager until I proved to him that I wasn't weak. I was told on a daily basis how weak I was. And it had a lot to do with the personality that was formed in me. And I know I've taken a long time to. It, you know, talk about that aspect of it, but there's a reason for that. And if you'll bear with me and listen, you'll understand why. The enemy was molding me 
into someone that had their conscience seared with a hot iron so that there was no way to come to Christ for that person. Because both myself and the enemy knew that I not only knew who God was, but I knew that he had been calling me since I was 14. And I had been not only rejecting him, but running. Let me ask you a question real quick. Only God knows who that person is with a heart that's so turned and then given over to a complete reprobate mind to the point where that happens. Because you have someone, you know, such as yourself, you have people that, you know, you know Paul did call himself the chief among sinners, right? And Paul did um, put people to death, um, you know, and then you, but you have someone who I believe is saved, like Jeffrey Dahmer, for example. I mean, look how reprobate he was. You know, so if Jeffrey Dahmer is born again, if he is saved, if we will save him, you know, see him in heaven, well, then, then, then I, where, where is, you know, where is the, you know, I always ask you, I always say, like, my is, answer is, um, you're probably not going to agree with, but that's okay. I don't believe that the reprobate mind passage or that the conscience seared with a hot iron, I don't believe that's talking about unsaved person who has been given chance after chance and rejecting God. I think that's talking about a believer who has fallen away and is choosing to count the blood of the covenant as a profane thing. and Is choosing to turn away from God. Um, now, maybe that person was never saved, but either way you look yeah. at it, I believe it's somebody who has at least heard the gospel and just as Jesus says, you know, the, the seeds fall on different ground. Um, maybe their heart was the stony places. Maybe it was among the weeds. But for whatever reason, my belief about that is that it's not talking about, you know, someone like me who went from a young teenager to a young adult in a lifestyle of rebellion. Um, I'm not saying that it's not, but I, I would say that someone like Jeffrey Dahmer would have to be proof of one of two things. Either it's not talking about uh, you know, someone who's a non-believer and has never been, or the place that we must go to become reprobate has nothing to do with the things we've done or even necessarily how long it's been. It's something God decides. God is outside of time. He's all knowing. He knows whether someone is going to accept Christ or not. And I'm not trying to be Calvinist either. I mean, yeah, but that, but that would be the way that I would look at it with pre predestination and election. Not from a Calvinist standpoint, but yeah, trying but to reconcile from, free will and predestination and stuff like that is God knows who he's going yeah, to choose. Yeah, he knows. So, yeah. yeah. So I would assume it'd be a person who, no matter the circumstance, would not choose God. I will say this, though. We don't know. Right. And I so agree, for you to live agree. your life, um, you don't even have to be doing the things I was doing. You could just be, you know, you could be a millionaire on Wall Street who's rejecting Christ. Um, I think it, I think God has has an immense amount of mercy and grace absolutely upon us because in my in my own opinion I think that the deceitfulness of sin how far you go into that after you've known God is what turns you reprobate and also I don't, I don't think don't, Romans one as far as the depraved mind or reprobate mind as the way that I read it um, I I don't think it doesn't mention that you can't be saved it's just that you're given over completely to your passions. Yeah, well, well, and, you know, flesh. That, right? it, it talks about how uh, it talks about how people have no excuse because of all the things around us, all the creation. There's no excuse not to believe in him. So it's, for unbelief, those who, it's unbelief and its consequences from that and what it, what it becomes. Obviously, it was right? really. It, it almost seems like those who believe, like who have it upon their heart that there is a God, but ignore that and just just live a life of sin and say, I don't want God. Like, yeah, James yes, says, says you know, there, but eventually, if you continue in that path, God knows whether you're going to choose him or not, like you guys are saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, James says, you believe that there is one God. You do it. Demons also believe and also tremble. Um, right. So, yeah, there are people who are what 
I would call theist um, or whatever. They're, right, they're, they're like, this. I'm living my life. I believe there is a God or a higher My, a my higher brother's being. one. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he believes that God's not going to send him to hell because he's a good person. I mean, he's a full-blown drug addict, but he's a good person. Um, I, anyways, he he just he doesn't believe that Jesus has anything to do with it, except for believing that. Which is the unbelief in the consequences, right? If he has not his faith in Jesus, if he's not born again, that leads to unbelief in its consequences, which is Romans one. Romans yeah, one, absolutely, right? yeah. But you know, really, what I was talking about was that a different scripture. I was at a point to where, I mean, I, I know I said reprobate mind, but I was kind of putting the two together. I was to the point to where I, looking back, I see that not as a teenager, but at the point before I got saved, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I believe that I was to the point where I was almost to the point of having my conscience seared with a hot iron. Know, and, and there not being any chances left. And so do, do you, in your, in your humble opinion, do you think that that's something that can be recognized? Um, well, I, I don't I know, but I, I do know this can be recognized. I knew that one of two things was going to happen that night. Either I was taking my life or something had to give, and it just so happened that that something was Jesus and uh, the change he made in me is a change that sometimes is extremely painful, and I, I, well, I have found myself longing for that ability to block things out, and then almost immediately repenting. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, you know, I kind of talked to you about that earlier this week. I was in a place to where I was hurting extremely bad. Um, a lot of people won't even understand it. I probably right. won't go fully into it. But um, the same as I know, but at the same time, it's like, a, for example, those who like know God and then somebody they're close to, like say their mom, dad, grandma, whatever it might be. Bar yeah. Irving, for example, right? He grew up knowing God. Yeah, absolutely. Was dying, and because he was praying that God would save his grandmother, like, like keep her alive, and he didn't. He just full blown rejected God after that. Kanye West, God and didn't Kanye answer me. Yeah, yeah. God, Jesus didn't answer me, so I no longer I, believe him. I would say in those people, they they were never. Bar, bar I agree. Or I agree. Were never, it was the same with me. Um, you know, and I guess one day, I guess we're gonna we're gonna you know do our testimonies again, uh, Jeremy. So. And uh, yeah. I actually want Jeremy Anderson to be there for it when, for us when we do it. But, um, sure. you know, I myself grew up, you know, in the church. I grew up in the faith and I Me thought too. that I believed. Um, I earnestly did in some points of my of my childhood. But looking back now and, and knowing what it truly is to be born again, um, and, and, and I did not. You know, um, I, I looked at some of my writings through live journal, as cringy as they are, when I was 18 or 19 a little bit. Probably, <laughs> and it was mixed in uh, leaven of, of new age beliefs even there at the time, even though I've had, you know, the gospel preached to me, um, you know, properly by my father, by my grandfather, by my uncle, you know, but I still, um, I, re I remember, you know, telling my grandparents that God didn't exist because my dad died and immediately regretting that afterwards when I was 18, you know, so, you know, again, like, there, it's, it's a huge nuanced discussion about reprobation, a huge nuanced discussion about if you are truly to become born again, are there times where God shows you grace throughout your life? Are there times that you understand God to a degree, but not completely until you get born again? Like well, that's a whole other discussion, you know. And sense. that a lot of that's in my testimony. I will say this for time's sake: if you want to hear my full testimony of you know everything that happened in my life up to the point of me coming to Christ, it'll be I'll link it in the video. Um, that I put on YouTube, um, and it's, it's up to you guys whether you link it in the, the podcast. Notes. Definitely will. We definitely will. Yeah, just send it to me through Instagram. I'll throw it in there. Well, well for time's sake, I, I'll jump forward uh -huh. and say this. Um, you know, I had my my time um, of street violence and street life as a teenager. Um, 
then my wife got pregnant with my daughter and we got married immediately. Um, the fact that I was raised in the church and my love for her and she never stopped going to church, going to church the whole time I was, you know, in prison as a juvenile, you know, living in the streets, the things I was doing. She was at, in church every time the doors were open. And, um, so it, it was like when, when, but we were still living in sin because we were having sex outside of marriage. You know what I mean? Uh, but would you, would you say that your wife, the way that you recognized, uh, the way your, your, your wife lived, did that take a big impact on you? Like according to faith? I would say it's the only reason it, it, it is what kept me grounded. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it, it's the reason that I, when she got pregnant, it's the reason that I left every bit of that, all the people, everything behind so much so that we moved to a different state to, to put it behind us. And, um, my daughter was born in 2001 and, uh, I, we went to church, my, my son was born, my oldest son was born in 2003, and um, we went to church every time the doors were open, and I worked all week, we went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and um, my mom and the man who I call dad, they got married a year before my wife and I did, um, so you know, he didn't come into my life until I was basically um, I was 17. That father figure that you've always wanted. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I mean, he, but see, the thing is, I, I, I also watched him go through struggles. Um, you know, right. this isn't a secret, so I'm not saying anything the whole the world doesn't know. Every church that pastors or has pastored knows this. You know, he struggled with pornography and, um, it, co it cost him his ability to preach for a year and he had to repent. He had to put himself under the elders. Um, he, he did, and I'm not talking repent because, hey, I got caught. I'm talking truly repent. I saw the same change in him from, I believe that when I first met him and probably the first few years of it, him and my mom's marriage, even though he was a pastor of two different churches, I don't believe he was saved. He doesn't know he was saved. Um, but he definitely repented, came to Christ, and the change was visible. The, the things that he believed that were far out there they were almost immediately changed. He was able to see the truth. Like he believed, a lot of Adventists believe this. Not Seventh Day Adventists. Don't misunderstand. Because he is a pastor in a denomination called the Advent Christian Church. Um, it's a small denomination that, in many ways, is they believe the same thing as, say, a Southern Baptist. Um, but a lot of them also believe in soul sleep. They believe their their um, eschatology is historicism, um, not historic premillennialism. Historicism, right? You know, that comes from Calvinism, and those things slowly changed. But then when the Lord through the different things that I'm getting ready to summarize when the Lord brought me to the place to where I had to choose him or choose death in this world. Um, when I came to Christ, um, the Lord used me just as much in his life as he used him in mine. Um, I never thought I would call anybody dad, especially not him. And not only do I look at him as my dad, just as much as if he was my biological father, but um, 
looks at me as his son. We have a wonderful relationship. Um, the Lord has used us to, in both of our lives. I got probably the one of the biggest honors of my life was I baptized him. Um, just he was a huge blessing in my life, and I was a huge blessing in his. But throughout my life with my children growing up, um, I, I still was not a believer. I went to church and faked as much as I could. You know, I, From growing up in church and then as an adult from going to church and always being extremely interested in eschatology and an avid reader and wanting to be an author, even in my worst times of my life, I do the Bible backwards, forwards, and upside down. Now, my theology was wrong, but I knew what the words were. And throughout my the lives of my children growing up, I raised them for the most part exactly the way that the Bible tells us to. Even though I may not have believed in my heart in certain things. And my biggest problem wasn't a lack of belief. It was a doubt that was there from the different things that we have put in front of us every single day, you know, from science and TV and all of that. And I had this doubt. Is God real? Is the Bible real? But I kept it to myself. And I definitely did not let it affect the way I raised my children. And by the year 2009, I truly thought that I was Christian. You know, I not only went to church, but I taught Sunday school and eventually became leader. And we moved from Concord, North Carolina, to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, I enrolled in seminary there. I was going to seminary there. And my wife got pregnant with our son. Um, uh, we called him Blake, but his name was Jeremy Blake Anderson, Jr. She got pregnant with him, and she was... Almost, she was like seven months pregnant, almost eight months, maybe seven and a half months pregnant. And she was having these headaches that were just worse than you could possibly imagine. And my wife's mom, when my wife was 13, her mom died from a brain aneurysm. So because of her history, um, her OBGYN sent her to a neurologist. They did an MRI and, um, I can't remember which neurologist, but it was at Cape Fear Valley. And the neurologist, the MRI, found a brain in it. And it was, it was in her carotid artery on her ocular nerve right behind her right eye. And it, so it was in a place where they could not operate on it at all. It was more dangerous to remove it than to leave. Even though if it ruptured, it would kill her. It was like the operation had a higher chance of death than leaving. So, wow. but there, that there was one. And she was pregnant with my son at this time. And there was, at the same time as when my dad got found out at the church he was at in Fayetteville or Spring Lake about his pornography addiction. So, they had to leave. They moved to back to South Carolina uh, near Charleston. So here we are. We're in North Carolina. We've got friends that we've made over the four years we've lived in North Carolina, but two of those years were in Concord. So, I mean, we had no family, not many friends. People at the church associated us with my dad. So, I mean, it, it was just a bad situation. Um, they had to take my son early so they could do the procedure on my wife. There was one procedure they could do, 
they could put a titanium coil around the aneurysm so that if it burst, the coil would give her uh, more of an opportunity to get to the hospital to have, you know, life-saving surgery or whatever. That's incredible. And, and, and it's 2024, and she's had that coil since 2011. Um, but in any case, that my son had to... Are you guys still there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I just saw where it said I was the host, so... Um, in any case, um, they had to take my son because of my wife's aneurysm. They, they, in order to do the procedure, they had to take him early. Um, he was in the NICU at Cape Fear Valley, but even though he was born at seven and a half months and he was only four pounds when he was born, he, they let him go from the hospital. He was out of the hospital before she was. Um, she was in the hospital for a long time, longer than my son was. And um, long story short, when she got out, even though I mean we we were in a home that we were they were really good people. We were we probably will never have an opportunity like this again. It was a rent to own opportunity. Um, you know, we weren't under any kind of contract. But our rent every month was going towards owning the house and had to leave all of that behind and come back to the place that had nothing but bad and evil memories for both me and my wife. Um, like I said, my whole testimony will be linked in the description, there is so much that, for time's sake, I left out. But there was a lot that happened during our marriage, early years. Um, I became addicted to opiates in my 20s. And um, I had a son outside of marriage uh, from another woman. And my wife, the wonderful woman of God she is, uh, his mother is a witch who not only doesn't believe in God, but she worships the gods, plural, of Wicca. And she um, she does witchcraft to this day. Um, and she's a full-blown alcoholic. I pray for her constantly. And I, I try to witness to her. Uh, my wife has to. Um, but in any case, my son, who my wife has every reason to resent, doesn't, and he calls her mom. And, you know, they are, they always have been closer than he and I have been, um, even though she's not his biological mother. I, even, we've been married, yeah, I mean, we've been married over 20 years, and honestly, I'm, I'm not just saying this to say it. There's, I love her more with every day, and I love her more now than I did when we were children, and I thought I could never love her. You know what I mean? Um, it, it's a stronger bond, but there's a reason for that. Uh, we moved back here to be around family because she had a brain aneurysm. We had a newborn who was premature, and we had two young children. One was 11, one was 9. And then we had my other son who stayed with us off and on, sometimes more during the year that he would stay with his birth mother, you know, sometimes less. But in any case, we had a lot going on. Um, thank the Lord we had the home that I'm sitting in right now that had since before we moved to North Carolina. Um, it was our very first home. And on it, so we had it. But moved back here. Um, we're only here for about four months, and my son Blake died. Um, he uh, was six months old, just at the. He was close to the line, to the age limit, to where he was too old for it to be 
called SIDS, but still young enough to where it could be called SIDS. Um, my wife and I both knew something was wrong with him. We took him to the doctor over and over. He was stopping breathing while he was awake and while he was asleep. Um, and we'd have to blow in his face you know, to make him start breathing again. Take him to the doctor, and the doctor would say that it was an acid reflux. Wow, man! One thing I'm that a, I have, yeah, I mean, it, just a couple points on that, dude. I have a, you know, my son's about to be two, so I could not yeah. imagine, but I love him more than anything in the whole world, dude, except for Christ, you know. And uh, I could not imagine how you feel. I'm so sorry to hear that, dude. I, I know what know. you mean. I know what you mean. Before it happened, I could never imagine. Um, yeah. There is no way to imagine it until you go through it. And when you go through it, I can tell you this. One thing that I struggle with, even as a Christian, who is very forgiving and loving, is the people who harm their own children. Right. I don't. Well, I could not imagine. Me either. I don't understand it. Um, and, and I was, like my son right now, he's, gonna, he's about to be two, and at his age, my brother and I got the crap kicked out of us daily by my mom's boyfriend at the time oh dude and dude God thrown down staircases like locked in bedroom drawers everything and then <laughs> i look at my own son who's like the same age as i was when i was abused and i just like how could how could you possibly do that exactly i know that some people it turns them into their parents and they continue the cycle of abuse but for me it was like like me i was a little older than you guys i was four and really five before my abuse started but because of it i made I sure that man exactly i i made sure my children knew they were loved that that they had everything they needed dude at the height of my drug addiction after like because when my son died all the pretending that that is how i know that i wasn't saved because I didn't just get mad at God. I completely turned my back on him. I would not let the word or name of God be said in my presence in my home. Um, my mom said something to my youngest son, who's 11 now, Connor, the one who has such a strong relationship with God. She said something to him when he was a toddler about God, and I lost it. I mean, lost it. And I told her, I mean, we were at her house. I told her that my son was not going to believe in fairy tales. And I'll never forget saying that because it haunts me to this day. Um, the, my wife, when my son died, that experience, she happened to be my, my brother and sister-in-law. My sister-in-law is no longer alive. She passed away like a, a, almost two years ago. But she was alive then, and they lived a mile and a half down the road from us. And my wife and my my six month old were spending the night at her sister and brother in law's house. And myself and my two older kids were here at home. And both of them, my daughter and my son, were in the bed with me. My daughter was twelve at the time, eleven or twelve. My son. I think she turned 12 not long after we moved back here. But my son was two years younger than her, so she was 12 when the baby was born. Um, in any case, they were both fell asleep watching movies that night, and I'll never forget it. They were, in the same, they were both in my bed with me, and were asleep. And at about 3 a.m., I woke up to someone pounding on my front door. And I got up and went to the door. It was my brother-in-law. And he was freaking out so much that I, I'll i never be able to forget the amount of fear and everything in him. And he told me what happened. And I was just in shock. But my wife, they wouldn't even let her ride the ambulance. Um, she literally felt she was running behind the ambulance and fell on her hands and knees in the road was there until her sister picked her up, took her to the car to follow the ambulance to the hospital. But she 
She woke up and he had stopped breathing and he was sleeping. She had just checked on him 30 minutes before. He was fine, but between the time that she checked on him and the time that she woke up and found him not breathing in his bassinet beside the couch where she was sleeping, it was only 30 minutes. And anyways, um, I'll never forget, we took my son and my daughter, my two oldest kids, to my sister-in-law's house. And they stayed there with their cousins, um, my sister-in-law, brother-in-law's two kids, their son and daughter. And my brother-in-law drove me to the hospital after we dropped the kids off. I got to the hospital and I walked in the emergency room. The nurse that met me at the door didn't tell me a word. I kept asking. She wouldn't tell me anything. I get to the back. And these geniuses, oh, they made me so mad that night. My son died. He wasn't pronounced dead till he got to the hospital, but they were never able to resuscitate him in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. So he technically died on the way there. Or before they got there. In any case, my wife was there and the nurse handed my son, who was not alive, to my wife. You don't hand a child who's just passed away to their mother. Right? She would not let him go. She, when I got there to her, she was holding him. Natural reaction right there. And she had been holding him for at least 30 minutes when I got there. It took me an hour to get him away from her. And she kept saying, I'll never forget it. This is one of the things that hardened me. She kept saying, Jesus will bring my baby back. Jesus can bring my baby back. And bro, I can. The image of my, my life the son haunts me to this day. Even though I've seen I've seen countless pictures of him alive, and I I should have memories of him alive because of how traumatic the experience was of her having him and me having to beg and finally say, Baby, please just let me hold our son. And when I said that it was like something clicked in her and she trusted me enough to hand him to me. It's like she didn't believe that I would give him off to them. But I didn't want to hold him. I knew he wasn't alive. Yeah. Bro, I can't describe it. Not his heart even. You know? no, I'm but sure, man. I'll never forget the way he looked. I'll never forget the way his body felt when she right. handed him to me. Even though I only had him in my arms for a matter of seconds, just long enough to take him from her and hand him to the closest person next to me. I didn't know if it was a doctor or a nurse. It ended up being a nurse, but I was so mad at those people for allowing her to hold him. Right. The cops were furious at those people for allowing him. Um, and Immediately, uh, it was like instinct kicked in, and mourning was not an option because I had a wife who was falling apart, who I was worried I was going to lose, and I had two children that needed both of their parents. And so I didn't have time to mourn. All I had time to do was be strong keep her from falling apart. But not long after they did all of that, we had to sit there and go through hours of interrogation by the police because of the this world we live in. Right, that, that, that do hurt their children. That's, what right. I'm saying. that's why I said I can't imagine. It. That's the, the, the only type of people that commit you know, any kind of crimes that I have a hard time thinking about to have to forgive. And I'm just glad it's God that is the one who has to do the forgiving. You know what I mean? Um, 
We're glad it's not me. But in any case, um, getting through the funeral, all of that was kind of like a blur. I remember having to try to explain to my 12-year-old daughter why it had happened. I wasn't to the, like, I hadn't gotten to the point to where I had fully rejected God. You know, my mind hadn't been able to process any of that. My daughter wanted to know why God let her brother die. And this was the Holy Spirit. This was God using someone who was going to become a worse person than they were before they got married and, you know, went through a life of living a regular, working a job and raising your children, and going to church, and all of that stuff. God used me and my knowledge of the Bible to, to go in the Bible to Job without even thinking about where I needed to go. I just turned immediately to Job, sat, and used the story of Job to explain to my daughter that I didn't know why God had taken her brother, but he had a reason. And that we might it might be years or we might never know in this life. But that God did have a reason and I I went from Job to all things work together for good for those who love God and call according to his purpose. And I didn't even have to think about it. I just flipped in the Bible. And I think about things like that now looking back, the way that God is able to use even those who... This is why I struggle with, was I saved and just not where I was supposed to be? Or... Was I not saved, but had a knowledge of scripture enough for God to use me to help my daughter? I don't know. But regardless, I was able to help her. If that helped her understand, I can remember her singing at his funeral. Um, and I can remember a little bit about his funeral. But after that, we had to start living life. And that was hard. Um, my wife ended up having to spend some time in the institution. She had a nervous breakdown. And again, you know, I had no choice but to be strong. I didn't have time to grieve. And the enemy used that. He knew how much it affected me. And he used it to harden my heart, turn me against God. And my son died in 2012. He was born in 2011. He died in 2012. By 2013, I had gone completely back into street life. I had found, I didn't join a gang again. I didn't go into that part of street life. You know, I still had to raise my children. But I became a drug dealer first, then a drug trafficker. I was someone who drove out of state to pick up large quantities of drugs and went from someone who sold drugs to users to had enough drugs for drug dealers. And all this time from 2013 to 2016, those three years of when I started this life of selling drugs again, you know, going completely into the streets, turning my back on God, never going to church, um, not letting the name of God be said at my house, all kinds of things. When I, a lot of things happened between my son dying and hitting rock bottom. In 2013, not long after I had turned to selling drugs and back into a life of sin, full on sin, I was having affairs uh, with other women. I was using my status. I, 
I was living like I was 20 years old again, and I was in my, I was in my 30s. I was in my early 30s. And my brother, well, he wasn't really my brother. Um, he was my best friend. He was my best friend from the time we were small. Uh, but we had lost touch because I had moved out of state not long after I moved back in state. My real brother, baby brother, married his sister. And that allowed he and I to connect. And he was the person growing up, always sold drugs, always. And by the time he was an adult in 2013, I was an adult, he had become someone who was big in the drug world. You know, after my son died, I didn't have a job. After, from the time we moved here, uh, December 2011 or either January 2012 to the time um, my son died and you know, even after that I didn't have a job I was looking for one but I was working for a day late because I didn't have a job and my best friend comes and he's like I know how to take care of your family and I know how we can make more money than you've ever made come and help me I need somebody to help me turn this into a business and I did well before 2013 was over he was dead um, he was someone Jeremy are you still there yeah I'm listening brother we're gonna go to uh, I, I didn't know if, you're good I just didn't know if John was still there anyways long story short uh, he died in 2013 well uh, that hardened me more and Eventually, I went, I started using drugs just to numb myself, and I would use a little more and a little more, and from 2013 to 2016, I, I went from, you know, having tons of money, selling drugs, several cars, a motorcycle, four-wheeler, to losing every bit of that, and being a full-blown IV drug addict. Um, I had hit complete rock bottom. Um, I, by 2017, I had really hit rock bottom. I went to jail in 2017. My wife left me in 2017. I didn't know if she was coming back. I didn't know what they were going to charge me with because um, even though they were my drugs I was using, I had different kinds of drugs that were in different uh, packages whenever I wrecked my car in 2017. Long story short, I was in jail for about a month. I get out and I was out for about a month and I was struggling with starting to use again. Um, my brother and I and bought some cocaine to get high with to shoot up. Um, and whatever girlfriend he was with at the time told them they could have my room. I was in the living room. This was October 28, 2017, and I'll never forget it. Um, I had come to my lowest point that I could possibly come to. Um, I was lower than any of the times I had gone to jail as a kid, prison as a kid, jail as an adult. I, I, I wanted to die. I did not want to be a drug addict. I went from someone that my kids looked up to as the model father to someone my daughter had zero respect for. I mean, zero. I had made her cry so many times from forcing her to give me money to buy drugs. Her and my oldest son had found me passed out needles in my arm several times. I had just lost the respect of everybody in my life who mattered. And I didn't want to live anymore. I wasn't using drugs again, but I was I had bought the drugs for one purpose. I was either going to use them to overdose on purpose or something. I mean that's the purpose I bought them. 
and I didn't want to take my life because you know, in the back of my mind was always, you know, if you kill yourself, you're going to hell. Nothing else matters. You kill yourself, you're going to hell no matter what. And for the first time in my life, I cried out audibly after over an hour of struggling with what to do. And the, the demonic presence in my living room being so powerful and so thick and the voices that were telling me to end it were almost audible. I can't even tell you for sure that they weren't audible. But the spiritual atmosphere in my living room was like smoke. I mean, it almost cut it with a knife. And I just I don't even know why I did it. I don't. I, it never came to my mind um, that I needed Jesus or I needed this, that, or the other. I, I know now that I did it because it was the Holy Spirit. But at the time, I didn't know why. But I cried out loud, really loud, Jesus, if you're real, please save me. And I made a promise that I would serve him for the rest of my life. And immediately, I mean, immediately, it was like a dam broke inside of me. Like this weight that had, or bubble that had been building in my chest, and this weight that was sitting on my chest lifted and bursted at the same time. And I started crying. And it was the first time wasn't just the first time that I had cried since my son died. It was the first time I had cried since I was a young child. And I think that not crying was probably one of the things that made me such a hard-hearted, cold-hearted person that if you were my enemy, I would, I would I didn't care if you lived or died. I didn't care who was the one that made it that way. But it was like all of that changed in an instant. And not only did I cry for the first time forever, but there was a change in me that was almost a beat. I had the worst mouth by the eye. And all of a sudden, if my brother put a CD in or a song on, there was a movie play or anything that was cursing. All of a sudden, the F bombs, the D word, the S word, they were bothering me. It's like, whoa, whoa. It wasn't like I had this immediate transformation where I was immediately on fire for God and I was witnessing to everybody I saw, but there was an immediate change in. My desires were different. My way of thinking was different. Um, I knew that I had to change so many things. But to my family, I had made all these promises all these times before. And so even though I had this true experience and I was a, I was truly a different person, it took a very long time or anybody in my family, my wife, my daughter, my son, anybody except for my youngest son, to believe that the change in me was real. I mean, even my mom, it just took a long time. But it, it, I remember it was like four or five months of them seeing a change that they had never seen, that I was sharing my testimony. Really? Um, you know, I loved going to church. It was what I wanted to do. There was just a change in me that had never been. And God just made a new person. I was literally the definition to be born again. Amen. Absolutely incredible, dude. That's probably the best testimony I've ever heard. Like, that, that's incredible. I'm almost speechless, to be honest with you. Dude, it, it is a testimony of that's God. Amazing. It, it is a testimony of God's goodness. Is a testimony of his grace and just how much 
mercy he does have on us as fallen, how much he loves us. Right. That's why it, it bothers me so bad when people talk about things like replacement theology and call me this and a racist. Dude, I, I couldn't do anything but love people if I try. I mean, I've had people wrong me that in my past life, Man, I would have drove to another state to hurt me. And it's like, even if I try to hold a grudge, I can't. And it's just, man, it's a testimony to God's goodness. And what a change and a new mind is. And I know we have to die to ourselves daily. and We have to renew our minds that I could easily fall back into old things that were before Christ if I allowed myself. But following Christ, staying in the Word, you know, living a lifestyle the way that Jesus tells us to in the Sermon on the Mount, if you are doing that and you have been born again, then you can't I'm not gonna sit here and tell you your life's gonna be roses. I can tell you that except for my son dying, I have gone through things that were harder and worse than I did before I was saved. But the difference is I had peace going through. And there is such a difference between happiness, what, what we in this world consider being happy, and joy. I can't promise anybody happiness that the world calls happiness. People think if they have enough money or if they have this or that or whatever, they're going to be happy. I can't promise you any of that, but I can promise you in Jesus Christ, you will know joy. You will know peace. Jeremy, I know you know what I'm talking about. You've been in situations where y'all didn't know where you were going to sleep. And yet, God always provided and you knew that even if you lost your life, things were going to be okay. Right, dude. That's just something that you don't have outside of Christ. Absolutely not. I'll tell you that I've, I've been in that spot in my own life where I wanted to kill myself plenty of times too growing up without God. You know, I, mean, I had no hope in anything else. But I got to tell you, bro, honestly, one of the best testimonies I think I've ever heard in my whole life. And uh, I hope it reaches far and wide to help people because we all think that we've got a bad or had a bad or whatever. But when you hear other people's lives story, you know, now, I know I've heard, I've heard life stories way, way worse than mine that made me ashamed of thinking that I had it bad. Right, right. You know, because we're still human, so I, there's been times where I got in my flesh and looked back and thought, woe is me. Um, and then the Lord would send somebody in my life who was going through something right then that made me feel so guilty for feeling this art for myself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, dude. Well, I love you, dude. Thank you so much. For I love you, too, bro. bro. Thank is, you for having me. Yeah, anytime, man. Anytime, honestly. Uh, I know you're going to be on here again uh, with me and John two hours. And uh, if John ever, or if I ever can't make it, you know you're going to be on the show anyway. So yeah, I'm always here for you guys. Yeah, you know that. Yeah, absolutely. And we're here for you, too, man. We love you. I know. Thank you so much. I love you guys. God bless you too, brother. All right. Have a good night, brother. You too, brother.